Um, it's, as always, a, an enormous privilege to, to be here in this beautiful cathedral and to be here at such an important moment for, for everyone in our country and beyond. Um, be afraid, be, be very afraid. Uh, once upon a time, a well-known tabloid newspaper called me the most dangerous woman in Britain. Um, sadly, that title has, I think, now been stolen by um, a very popular politician north of the border. For this, we will sue. <laughs> um, so, so what was it? What, made, what was it that, that, that made me so dangerous in the in the eyes of that particular tabloid newspaper? Well, I believe in fundamental rights and freedoms. I believe in human rights, not just as a system of law, but as a system of ethical values that bind together the entire human family. I'm not here to give uh, a law lecture. I could quote all sorts of instruments, the Universal Declaration, the European Convention, our own Human Rights Act, all, all frameworks very much under attack, even in the current general election campaign. I could do that, but that would take too much time. So instead, let me sum up everything that I believe about human rights with, with three words. Dignity, equality, and fairness. Dignity, as in a belief that every single individual human life anywhere on the planet is precious. Every newborn baby, every newly arrived asylum seeker anywhere on the globe is precious, not because they're good or they're bad or they're British or they're American or they're of any particular nationality, gender, race, sexuality, but just because they're alive. Not a good person or a bad person, not someone who's already made their contribution to society, but every single human being just because they're alive. And respect for this idea of dignity is, uh, is not always easy. It does sometimes require respect for people who haven't always respected others, and even for people who have, to some extent, lost their self-respect. And equality, not, not as an, a, an idea of formal equality where everyone has to be exactly the same or has to have exactly the same amount of talent or money or whatever it is, but, but equal treatment under the law. And fairness and uh, specifically the idea of procedural fairness. Nothing bad should happen to you without a fair hearing. And in particular, when you're, when you're facing um, criminal charges and a, a, a severe detriment, you ought, to, uh, you ought to be presumed innocent, you ought to have access to justice, you ought to have advice and representation. So dignity, equality and fairness, but the greatest of these, I argue, is equality. Now, why do I say that? Why do I say that the, the right, the human right to equal treatment under the law is more important even than rules against torture and slavery and the respect for your privacy and your free speech and all these vital, these freedom of thought, conscience and religion, all of these vital human rights? Why is equal treatment the most important human right of all? Well, because in my experience, Whilst critics say they don't believe in human rights, they say that they're um, selfish libertarian um, values, or they say that they're politically correct gone mad, in truth, everybody loves human rights. Their own. And those of people like themselves and their friends and their family and people they identify with, it's other people's rights and freedoms that are a problem. And in my view, there would be no torture and no modern-day slavery and no blanket intrusions into people's privacy or freedom of thought, conscience and religion and so on if, uh, if we treated others as we would like to be treated, if we walked around in others' shoes and so on. And at a general election time, we do need to remember that democracy has to continue in between elections. And democracy is more than just casting a vote once every five years. If democracy were just about casting a vote every five years and allowing the winner or the coalition of winners to take all, what would stop 
a leader that swept to power with a popular majority. I know that's unlikely in the, in the election that's coming, but it has happened in the past. A, a charismatic leader sweeps to power with a popular mandate and then decides that they will lock up their opponents. They will censor the critical press. They will do all sorts of things that interfere with people's civil rights and freedoms until democracy itself is shut down. That is not a dystopian nightmare. That is something that has happened in my lifetime in other parts of the world, which is why I say democracy is not just about voting and it's not just about majoritarianism. It is also about fundamental rights and freedoms and the rule of law. These principles keep democracy alive and without them, democracy would eat itself. It would be very short-lived and illusory indeed. So what of this charge that, um, that rights are somehow selfish and uh, they, don't, they don't build mutuality and they don't allow responsibility in society? What do I say to that charge? Firstly, I say, we are bound by so many laws in, uh, in modern democracies that it's not much to ask that the powerful owe a few responsibilities to the people. The, the second thing to say is that, is that because rights and freedoms are an ethical as well as um, a legal framework, we cannot deliver them if we don't, uh, if we don't respect them for each other. I cannot deliver um, free speech for any individual in society if other people aren't prepared to listen. I cannot protect one person's privacy if we don't sometimes take legal steps to stop other people intruding too much into their space. Tom Paine, the great rights activist, wrote about the drafting of the French Declaration of Rights many, many years ago. And he remarked that during the drafting process, some had said that surely um, a Bill of Rights needs to be matched by an equal and opposite Bill of Responsibilities. He noted that this, this demonstrated a mind that had reflected, but reflected not enough. Because a Bill of Rights is by reciprocity a Bill of Responsibilities as well. And our Human Rights Act that, re that ref reflects Churchill's post-war legacy is not, is not a selfish or ultra-libertarian document. It is, it is a set of values that acknowledges that human beings are not islands. They are individuals, precious individuals, but social creatures as well. And that is why so many references in the Human Rights Act and the European Convention on Human Rights are to what is necessary in a democratic society. And indeed, all your civil and political rights and freedoms reflect your need as a human being to rub along with others. Of course you don't want to be killed or tortured or enslaved or locked up without charge. Of course you want um, the right to a fair trial, but you need, you need privacy, but there also must be lawful surveillance because we are, so, we are social creatures. There must be speech and conscience and association, association, all to reflect your need to engage with wider society as an individual and a social creature. These instruments are at stake in this election by some powerful political and media interests who want to pull Britain out of the Human Rights Convention and scrap the Human Rights Act. And they want to do this in the very summer that we celebrate 800 years of Magna Carta, and they will all drink champagne at Runnymede and wrap themselves in that great instrument, which was an inspirational instrument for 1215, but the struggle for rights and freedoms did not end there. Let me end by remarking on that contradiction and that hypocrisy with the words of the great legal philosopher, Tony Hancock. Remember Magna Carta. Did she die in vain? <laughs> Thanks for listening.